Helen's Babies, Part Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Helen's Babies by John Haberton, Part Ten. Mothers of American boys, accept from me a tribute of respect which no words can fitly express. Of wonder greater than any of the great things of the world ever inspired, of adoration as earnest and devout as the Catholic pays to the Virgin, in a single day I, a strong man with nothing else to occupy my mind, am reduced to physical and mental worthlessness by the necessities of two boys not over mischievous or bad, and you, heaven only knows how. Have unbroken weeks, months, years, yes, lifetimes of just such experiences, and with them the burden of household cares, of physical ills and depressions, of mental anxieties that pierce your hearts with as many sorrows as grieved the holy mother of old. Compared with thy endurance, that of the young man, the athlete, is as weakness. The secret of thy nerves, wonderful even in their weakness, is as great as that of the power of the winds. To display decision, thy opportunities are more frequent than those of the greatest statesman. Thy heroism laughs into insignificance that of fort and field. Thou art trained in a school of diplomacy such as the most experienced court cannot furnish. Do scoffers say thou canst not hold the reins of government? Easier is it to rule a band of savages than to be the successful autocrat of thy little kingdom. Compared with the ways of men, even thy failures are full of glory. Be thy faults what they may, thy one great mysterious unapproachable success places thee in desert far above warrior, rabbi, or priest. The foregoing soliloquy passed through my mind as I lay upon the bed where I had thrown myself after leaving the children's room. Whatever else attempted to affect me mentally found my mind a blank until the next morning. When I awoke to realize that I had dropped asleep just where I fell, and that I had spent nearly twelve hours lying across a bed in an uncomfortable position, and without removing my daily attire, my next impression was that quite a bulky letter had been pushed under my chamber door. Could it be that my darling? I hastily seized the envelope and found it addressed in my sister's writing, and promising a more voluminous letter than that lady had ever before honored me with. I opened it, dropping an enclosure which doubtless was a list of necessities which I would please pack, etc., and read as follows: July first, eighteen seventy-five. My dear old brother, wouldn't I like to give you the warmest of sisterly hugs? I can't believe it, and yet I'm in ecstasies over it. To think that you should have got that perfection of a girl. Who has declined so many great catches? You, my sober, business-like, unromantic big brother. Oh, it's too wonderful! But now I think of it, you're just the people for each other. I'd like to say it's just what I'd always longed for, and that I invited you to Hillcrest to bring it about. But the trouble with such a story would be that it wouldn't have a word of truth in it. You always did have a faculty of doing just what you pleased, and what nobody ever expected you to do. But now you've exceeded yourself. And to think that my little darlings played an important part in bringing it all about, I shall take the credit for that. For if it hadn't been for me, who would have helped you, sir? I shall expect you to remember both of them handsomely at Christmas. I don't believe I'm guilty of a breach of confidence in sending the enclosed, which I have just received from my sister-in-law. That is to be. It will tell you some causes of your success, of which you, with a man's conceit, haven't imagined for a minute. And it will tell you too of a maiden's first and natural fear under such circumstances, a fear which I know that you, with your honest, generous heart, will hasten to dispel. As you're a man, you're quite likely to be too stupid to read what's written between the lines. So I'd better tell you that Alice's fear is that in letting herself go so easily, she may have seemed to lack proper reserve and self-respect. You don't need to be told that no woman alive has more of these very qualities. Bless your dear old heart, Harry! You deserve to be shaken to death if you're not the happiest man alive. I must hurry home and see you both with my own eyes, and learn to believe that all this wonderful, glorious thing has come to pass. Give Alice a sister's kiss for me. 
if you know how to give more than one kind, and give my cherubs a hundred each from the mother that wants to see them so much. With love and congratulations, Helen. The other letter, which I opened with considerable reverence and more delight, ran as follows. Hillcrest, June 29, 1875. Dear friend Helen, something has happened, and I am very happy, but I am more than a little troubled over it, too, and as you are one of the persons nearly concerned, I am going to confess to you as soon as possible. Harry, your brother, I mean, will be sure to tell you very soon, if he hasn't done so already, and I want to make all possible haste to solemnly assure you that I hadn't the slightest idea of such a thing coming to pass, and I didn't do the slightest thing to bring it about. I always thought your brother was a splendid fellow, and had never been afraid to express my mind about him, when there was no one but girls to listen. But out here I've somehow learned to admire him more than ever. I cheerfully acquit him of intentionally doing anything to create a favorable impression. If his several appearances before me have been studied, he is certainly the most original being I ever heard of. Your children are angels, you've told me so yourself, and I've my own very distinct impression on the subject, but they don't study to save their uncle's appearance. The figures that unfortunate man has cut several times, well, I won't try to describe them on paper, for fear he might some day see a scrap of it and take offence. But he always seems to be patient with them, and devoted to them, and I haven't been able to keep from seeing that a man who could be so lovable with thoughtless and unreasonable children must be perfectly adorable to the woman he loved, if she were a woman at all. Still, I hadn't the faintest idea that I would be the fortunate woman. At last the day came, but I was in blissful ignorance of what was to happen. Your little Charlie hurt himself, and insisted upon Herr, your brother, singing an odd song to him, and just when the young gentleman was doing the elegant to a dozen of us ladies at once, too. If you could have seen his face, it was too funny, until he got over his annoyance and began to feel properly sorry for the little fellow. Then he seemed all at once to be all tenderness and heart, and I did wish for a moment that conventionalities didn't exist, and I might tell him that he was a model. Then your youngest playfully spilt a plate of soup on my dress. Don't be worried, twas only a common muslin, and twill wash. Of course I had to change it, and as I retired— the happy thought struck me that I'd make so elaborate a toilette that I wouldn't finish in time to join the other ladies for the usual evening walk. Consequence, I would have a chance to monopolize a gentleman for half an hour or more, a chance which, no thanks to the gentlemen who don't come to Hillcrest, no lady here has had this season. Every time I peered through the blinds to see if the other girls had started, I could see him— looking so distressed, and brooding over those two children as if he was their mother, and he seemed so good. He seemed pleased to see me when I appeared, and coming from such a man, the implied compliment was fully appreciated. Everything he said to me seemed a little more worth hearing than if it had come from any man not so good. Then suddenly your eldest insisted on retailing the result of a conversation he had had with his uncle, and the upshot was that Harry declared himself. He wasn't romantic a bit, but he was real straightforward and manly, while I was so completely taken aback that I couldn't think of a thing to say. Then the impudent fellow kissed me, and I lost my tongue worse than ever. If I had known anything of his feelings beforehand, I should have been prepared to behave more properly. But, oh, Helen, I am so glad I didn't know. I should be the happiest being that ever lived, if I wasn't afraid that you and your husband might think that I had given myself away too hastily. As to other people, we will see that they don't know a word about it for months to come. Do write that I was not to blame, and make believe accept me as a sister, because I can't offer to give Harry up to anyone else you may have picked out for him. Your sincere friend, Alice Mayton. Was there ever so delightful a reveille? All the boyishness in me seemed suddenly to come to the surface, and instead of saying and doing the decorous things which novelists' heroes do under similar circumstances, I shouted, Hurrah! and danced into the children's room so violently that Budge sat up in bed and regarded me with reproving eyes, 
while Toddy burst into a happy laugh and volunteered as a partner in the dance. Then I realized that the rain was over and the sun was shining. I could take Alice out for another drive, and until then the children could take care of themselves. I remembered suddenly and with a sharp pang that my vacation was nearly at an end, and I found myself consuming with impatience to know how much longer Alice would remain at Hillcrest. It would be cruel to wish her in the city before the end of August, yet I. Uncle Harry, said Budge, my papa says tisn't nice for folks to sit down and go to thinkin' before they've brushed their hair mornin's. That's what he tells me. I beg your pardon, Budge, said I, springing up in some confusion. I was thinking over a matter of a great deal of importance. What was it? My goat? No, of course not. Don't be silly, Budge. Well, I think about him a good deal, and I don't think it's silly a bit. I hope he'll go to heaven when he dies. Do angels have goat carriages, Uncle Harry? No, old fellow, they can go about without carriages. When I go to heaven, said Toddy, rising in bed, I's going to have lots of goat carriages, and I's going to tate all the angels a widen. With many other bits of prophecy and celestial description, I was regaled as I completed my toilet, and I hurried out of doors for an opportunity to think without disturbance. Strolling past the hen yard, I saw a meditative turtle, and picking him up and shouting to my nephews, I held the reptile up for their inspection. Their window blinds flew open, and a unanimous, though not exactly harmonious, oh! greeted my prize. Where did you get it, Uncle Harry? Asked Budge. Down by the hen coop. Budge's eyes opened wide. He seemed to devote a moment to profound thought, and then he exclaimed, Why, I don't see how hens could lay such a big thing. Just put him in your hat till I come down, will you? I dropped the turtle in Budge's wheelbarrow and made a tour of the flower borders. The flowers, always full of suggestion to me, seemed suddenly to have new charms and powers. They actually impelled me to try to make rhymes, me, a steady white goods salesman. The impulse was too strong to be resisted, though I must admit that the results were pitifully meagre. As radiant as that matchless rose which poet artists fancy, as fair as whitest lily blows, as modest as the pansy, as pure as dew which hides within Aurora's sun kissed chalice. As tender as the primrose sweet, all this and more is Alice. In inflicting this fragment upon the reader, I have not the faintest idea that he can discover any merit in it. I quote it only that a subsequent experience of mine may be more intelligible. When I had composed these wretched lines, I became conscious that I had neither pencil nor paper wherewith to preserve them. Should I lose them? My first self constructed poem? Never. This was not the first time in which I had found it necessary to preserve words by memory alone. So I repeated my ridiculous lines over and over again, until the eloquent feeling of which they were the graceless expression inspired me to accompany my recital with gestures. Six, eight, ten, a dozen, twenty times I repeated these lines, each time with additional emotion and gestures. When a thin voice, very near me, remarked, Ockin Howie, you does just as if you was swimmin. g Turning, I beheld my nephew Toddy. How long he had been behind me, I had no idea. He looked earnestly into my eyes, and then remarked, Ockin Howie, your face is wed, just like a woozy posy. Let's go right into breakfast, Toddy, said I aloud, as I grumbled to myself about the faculty of observation which Tom's children seemed to have. Immediately after breakfast, I dispatched Mike with a note to Alice, informing her that I would be glad to drive her to the falls in the afternoon, calling for her at two. Then I placed myself unreservedly at the disposal of the boys for the morning, it being distinctly understood that they must not expect to see me between lunch and dinner. I was first instructed to harness the goat, which order I obeyed, and I afterward watched that grave animal as he drew my nephews up and down the carriage road, his countenance as demure as if he had no idea of suddenly departing when my back should be turned. 
the wheels of the goat carriage uttered the most heart-rending noises I ever heard from ungreased axle, so I persuaded the boys to dismount, and submit to the temporary unharnessing of the goat, while I should lubricate the axles. Half an hour of dirty work sufficed, with such assistance as I gained from juvenile advice, to accomplish the task properly. Then I put the horned steed into the shafts, Budge cracked the whip, the carriage moved off without noise, and Toddy began to weep bitterly. "'Cowage is all bloke,' said he. "'Wheels don't sing a bitty no more.' While Budge remarked, "'I think the carriage sounds kind of lonesome now, don't you, Uncle Harry?' "'Uncle Harry,' asked Budge, a little later in the morning, "'do you know what makes the thunder?' "'Yes, Budge. When two clouds go bump into each other, they make a good deal of noise, and they call it thunder.' "'That ain't it at all,' said Budge. "'When it thundered yesterday, it was because the Lord was riding along through the sky, and the wheels of his carriage made an awful noise, and that was the thunder.' "'Don't like nasty old thunder,' remarked Toddy. "'It goes into our cellar and makes all the milk sour. Maggie said so. And so I can't have no nice white tea for my burps pup.' "'I should think you'd like the Lord to go a-ridin', Toddy, with all the angels running after him,' said Budge, "'even if the thunder does make the milk sour, and tis so splendid to see the thunder bang.' "'How do you see it, Budge?' I asked." "'Why, don't you know when the thunder bangs, and then you see an awful bright place in the sky? "'That's where the Lord's carriage gives an awful pound, and makes little cracks through the floor of heaven, and we see right in. "'But what's the reason we can't ever see anybody through the cracks, Uncle Harry?' "'I don't know, old fellow. I guess it's because it isn't cracks in heaven that look so bright. "'It's a kind of fire that the Lord makes up in the clouds. You'll know all about it when you get bigger.' "'Well, I'll feel awful sorry if tain't anything but fire. "'Do you know that funny song my papa sings about? "'Roarin' thunders, lightnings, blazes, shout the great creator's praises?' "'I don't know exactly what it means, but I think it's kind of splendid, don't you?' "'I did know the old song. "'I had heard it in a western camp meeting when scarcely older than Budge, "'and it left upon my mind just the effect it seemed to have done on his.' I blessed his sympathetic young heart, and snatched him into my arms. Instantly he became all boy again. "'Uncle Howie!' he shouted. "'You crawl on your hands and knees and play you was a horse, and I'll ride on your back.' "'No, thank you, Budge. Not on the dirt.' "'Then let's play menagerie, and you be all the animals.' To this proposition I assented, and after hiding ourselves in one of the retired angles of the house— so that no one could know who was guilty of disturbing the peace by such dire noises, the performance commenced. I was by turns a bear, a lion, a zebra, an elephant, dogs of various kinds, and a cat. As I personated the latter named animals, Toddy echoed my voice. "'Meow, meow,' said he. "'That's what cat says when they goes down wells.' "'Faith, and it's him that knows,' remarked Mike, who had invited himself to a free seat in the menagerie, and assisted in the applause which had greeted each personation. "'Would you believe it, Mr. Harry, that young divil got out the front door one morning afore sunrise, all in his little nightgown, and went over to the doctor's and picked up a kitten lying on the kitchen doormat and throwed it down the well. The doctor wasn't home, but the missus saw him, and her heart was that tender that she hurried out and throwed boards down for de poor little base to stand on, and let down a hoe on a string, and when she got de poor little thing out, she was that faint that she dropped on the grass, and it cost Mr. Lawrence nigh on to thirty dollars to have the doctor's well cleaned out. "'Yes,' said Toddy, who had listened carefully to Mike's recital, and Kitty Kitty said, "'Meow, meow, when she go down the well,' and Miss Doctor said, "'Bad boy, go home, don't never tum to my house no more.' That's what she said to me. "'Now be some more animals, Ock and Howie. Can't you be a whale?' "'Whales don't make a noise, Toddy. They only splash about in the water.' "'Then grop in the cistern and plash, can't you?' Lunchtime, and after it the time for Toddy to take his nap. Poor Budge was bereft of a playmate, for the doctor's little girl was sick, so he quietly followed me about with a wistful face, that almost persuaded me to take him with me on my drive, our drive. 
Had he grumbled, I would have felt less uncomfortable, but there's nothing so touching and overpowering to either gods or men as the spectacle of mute resignation. At last, to my great relief, he opened his mouth. Uncle Harry, said he, do you suppose folks ever get lonesome in heaven? I guess not, Budge. Do little boy angels, papas, and mamas go off visitin' and stay so long? I don't exactly know, Budge, but if they do, the little boy angels have plenty of other little boy angels to play with, so they can't very well be lonesome. Well, I don't believe they could make me happy when I wanted to see my papa and mamma. When I haven't got anybody to play with, then I want papa and mamma so bad, so bad as if I would die if I didn't see em right away. I was shaving, and only half done, but I hastily wiped off my face, dropped into a rocking chair, took the forlorn little boy into my arms, and kissed him, caressed him, sympathized with him, and devoted myself entirely to the task and pleasure of comforting him. His sober little face gradually assumed a happier appearance. His lips parted in such lines as no old master ever put upon angel lips. His eyes, from being dim and hopeless, grew warm and lustrous and melting. At last he said, Uncle Harry, I'm ever so happy now, and can't Mike go around with me and the goat all the time you're away riding, and bring us home some candy and marbles, oh yes, and a new dog? Anxious as I was to hurry off to meet my engagement, I was rather disgusted as I unseated Budge and returned to my razor. So long as he was lonesome and I was his only hope, words couldn't express his devotion, but the moment he had, through my efforts, regained his spirits, his only use for me was to ask further favors. Yet in trying the poor boy, judicially, the evidence was more dangerous to humanity in general than to Budge. It threw a great deal of light upon my own peculiar theological puzzles, and almost convinced me that my duty was to preach a new gospel. End of part ten. Read by Kara Schallenberg on March tenth, two thousand eight, in San Diego, California.